day six harvesting honey now this is one of the most exciting parts of beekeeping we'll show you at least five ways to extract honey from the hive and how to store it properly within budgets so it goes from ultra cheap pantyhose to the three hundred thousand dollar mobile harvesting trucks option so honeybees are some of the world's most important pollinators but harvesting their honey is no easy task it comes with stings and potentially snake bites and all sorts of other things so beekeepers have been in harvesting honey for centuries and today is still a difficult and time consuming job beekeeper must first use smoke to help calm the bees then with a hive tool carefully pry a hive open uh, get the lid and the body parts of all the different components apart remove the frames containing the containing the honeycomb and then place the frames in an extractor which spins them around to separate the honey using gravity and centrifugal force from the comb and then the honey is then strained and filtered to remove any debris and the result is a beautiful golden liquid that would be enjoyed by many the world over after the honey is bottled the beekeeper must return the frames to the hive where the bees will start the process all over again and beekeepers around the world take pride in harvesting the honey it's a difficult but rewarding job that helps ensure the health of our environment as well as the bees harvesting honey without electricity there's an exploration of traditional techniques around the world next. And throughout history, beekeepers have developed a variety of methods to do harvesting without the use of electricity, of course, because that's only been around for about 120 years or so. While modern beekeepers often rely on electric powered extractors and other machines to produce honey, traditional beekeepers and those that prior to the 19th century around the world had, had to find ways to collect and process honey without electricity. So the most common method of harvesting honey comes by using a bee smoker and essentially bee smokers are device, devices uh, or tools that produce smoke which is used to calm the bees and make them less aggressive. This allows beekeepers to open the hive, access the honeycomb and uh, taking less stings while doing it. I'm not going to say you ain't going to take any stings because the chances are that there is likely to be uh, some loss of life here and uh, in terms of the number of worker bees and gar bees that try and sting you to protect their valuable resources a which is the honey so once the honeycomb is exposed the beekeeper uses a hive tool to carefully remove it from the hive and place it in a container and this method involves simply destroying the hive which is usually a bark hive and then and or in some cases can be made out of thatch called otherwise called skep but we're going to talk about different kinds of hives in a later episode uh, but yeah essentially they could destroy the bark hive and uh, this method is not safe and um, or efficient is using a bee smoker perhaps and reusing the hive and hive parts but it's still a traditional te technique used in many parts of the world today and if you want to look up honey hunters they literally can hang off cliffs and uh, trees and they've got bare minimum of protective gear on them and they're using ladders and ropes uh, so yeah once the honeycomb has been removed from the hive beekeepers must extract the honey from the combs so this can be done by squeezing the honeycomb by hand or using a manual honey extractor. Finally, honey must be processed and stored properly to ensure its freshness and quality. And also be sure that you take off capped honey. Uh, you want to have a bit about 85 to 90 percent of the frame. Uh, the comb needs to be capped, and that's when you know that the honey is ripe. If you take the honey that's unripe or uncapped, the likelihood is that that honey is going to be uh, too high in moisture content and it can end up actually fermenting and then therefore destroying your entire harvesting crop so we uh, employ you to make sure that you've got 85 percent of your honey cap before you actually take it off so pantyhose we talked about not so much upmarket but they are a really budget way of being able to just literally take the comb that you've taken out of a colony so you take the comb out of a colony however you've got that whether you've done a bee removal or you've taken them out of a tree or a water meter whatever the case may be you can take that comb the honeycomb put it through clean uh, unused version pantyhose and you can literally just uh, you know close it and then squeeze it over a bowl and what ends up happening is that the wax stays inside the pantyhose and the honey drips out it's a messy process but it's quite viable and budget friendly a honey a honey conical filter which kind of like takes the place of it also still uses gravity but uh, in this case you're not necessarily going to be squeezing the honey by this the honeycomb by hand uh, and then once you go from there you can also start making the drip tray system which is essentially just using uh, some coat hanger wire 
and you can create yourself a, a 45 degree angle in the drip tray. You're going to be using top bars potentially, or even bar carbs as I, as I mentioned earlier on. You're going to mostly crush the honey. And there are ways and means of doing this uh, with a wax press that doesn't require electricity. Electrical versions of this, which can be uh, much better suited for commercial use or for cooperative use, where a group of people can buy, you know, put the funding together and buy one of these machines and then have a scheduled access to it over a period of time. And uh, this is a model that's used all over Africa, commercial operations. Use what's called an actual centrifuge, which in South Africa is not, not necessarily the same thing as what we would think it is. A centrif centrifugal force is what's used in an, in ele an electric or manual spinner, um, whereas in a, uh, on, on a spindle and it turns cylindrically around and rotates and rotates at high speed to use centrifugal force to push the honey, pull the honey out to the sides. The centrifuge actually is basically where you would dump all your comb that's come off a top bar hive and uh, or bark hives and it goes into one big massive vat and uh, essentially what ends up happening is that with a bit of heat and a bit of um, motion and vibration what ends up happening is that the combs break down and then from there you're going to be looking at going into the manual extractors what we call the manual uh, honey spinners or honey extractors you might want to use honey pumps they're pretty useful to move vast, you know, large commercial size amounts of honey around between your extractors, getting them into settling tanks, and then getting them from settling tanks to your bottling uh, facilities like we have at the shop in Centurion. Uh, honey harvesting is something that can be offered as a service. We do it at our shop in, in Centurion, and there are a number of places around the country that will do that for you as well. It is a paid for service or paid for fee where you bring in your your supers that are full of, of frames that, that need extracting. We'd weigh them beforehand, then we would uh, do the extraction, uncap the, uncap the comb, do the extraction, bottle the stuff for you, weigh it again, give you back your super, weigh the, the super with the frames in it so that you can see what the difference was, and we give you your jars back full of honey and then charge you a fee for that. So those kind of services are available. Um, if you want, you could obviously not put it in a bottle and you just have it put into buckets and then you can do the bottling yourself. That would be a slightly less fee as well, of course. And these are our services available in Centurion and around the country by, through our shop in Centurion. And you may even decide to do this as potentially provide the service for other beekeepers as a business as well. So there is a business opportunity right there in the making as an entrepreneur, but there are also legal requirements for these kind of things. There's food standards, you need to get food permits, uh, generally speaking. And also when you're labeling your honey, there are also requirements for things like uh, the origin of the honey, the country of origin, the number of net weight grams in there, in the container, a physical address, a contact details, the company or the, the name of the company that bottled it, and obviously also the price needs to be on there and a date of expiry. Now, obviously honey doesn't necessarily expire as long as it's been sealed properly. They've found honey in, in, in the uh, Pharaoh's tombs and things like that in jars there that were still actually edible and that's going back 3000 years. So a uh, use by date goes on to any food labeling. And also you would need to mention if, if it was irradiated, it, usually imported honey is irradiated. What kind, of, what kind of honey actually is it? So you have varieties of honey that come, varietals, and this refers to basically the source of where the bees were foraging for the majority of the type of honey that you harvested at any given time off, off of a frame or off of a super in an apiary. So you could have an apiary site uh, next to or within a, an orange citrus farm, for example, which is really good honey, it's, it fetches a premium. And if that's the case, then when you went there, if your supers were empty, and when you left there, your supers were harvested and you had honey to harvest in that particular time frame period of the blossoms being flowering, then what you can do is you can say that that honey is orange blossom honey and uh, that should go on your label. And a similar thing would be for avocados and sunflowers and lychees and whatever other crops that you can think of where you've had your bees arrive at a particular apiary site and they have had um, uh, very little honey when they arrived there or that they had uh, wet supers when they arrived there so it was empty supers or, or near to empty supers when you arrived there and then when you left there they, you harvested that honey then you can actually specify that that honey is of that type of a crop or source from that kind of crop so again for example we mentioned things like lavender there's blue gum there generally if you're not sure then you're going to call it multiflora 
but uh, it does make it pretty cool if you can actually name it and, and back it up. So we've had uh, honey from watermelon, for example, which is an absolutely delicious honey. Uh, you can get soy honey, you can get blue gums, you can get uh, granadella, you can get, uh, yeah, name your pick, all right? Um, there's also apple apple orchard honey. So macadamia is one of my favorites. It's really good honey and really nice nutty flavor. So uh, it's not that they've been flavored in that way. It's just that a lot of people ask me, how do you, what, you know, how do you get macadamia honey? Do you flavor it? Do you put in food essences or whatever the case is? And we're like, no, the bees went and foraged off macadamia trees, off the flowers on the trees when they were flowering. That's why it tastes like macadamia nuts. Okay, and that goes the same with any of the other types and varietals of honey that you can get out there in the market. And unfortunately, majority of the store-bought stuff has been mixed and it's been likely imported as well. So it's got, it, it doesn't have any specific taste. It's just got a generic honey type syrup taste. And uh, that's what you get. Whereas when you're actually buying bee honey from a beekeeper, there's a very good chance that it's not going to taste anything like a honey in a shop. And uh, people can't believe that it's actually honey because they've been, they've been uh, uh, kind of almost like uh, brainwashed to know that honey is what you get in the store, which is actually not necessarily the case. All right, guys. So thanks for, for joining us today and uh, look forward to, to seeing you on day seven.